Welcome, everybody. First of all, let me say it is wonderful to see so many people at the Migration Policy Institute this morning. By the way, I'm Andrew Seeley, president of MPI. Um, it is wonderful to see people in person. We do too little of this still. I know we're doing more of it than we used to, but it is. this is one of our, our first chances to have, have all of you in the room here. Um, welcome to those of you on the webcast. I know there's several hundred people on the webcast, so you're actually the, the majority here, and thank you for your patience um, in waiting for us to start. Uh, for those that are not in Washington, D.C., or at least in downtown Washington, D.C., um, there is a summit of African leaders going on in this city, and so traffic is, um, <laughs> yes, I hear laughter from the uh, audience here for good reason. Traffic is is crazier than usual by, by several multiples. Um, it is a great honor to have Monique Pariat with us here today. Thank you, Monique. She is the European Commission's Director General for Migration and Home Affairs. Um, we have been trying to set up this meeting for two years, but it could not come at a better time. We, we actually were trying to set this, this up in spring of, of uh, 2020, and we ended up doing a, a virtual meeting with a few people because obviously we were all in lockdown at the time. And then we were very fortunate she joined us for the 20th anniversary of MPI last November, where we honored Kathleen Newland, who's here with us this morning, and Dimitri Papadimitrio, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, and, and uh, as good chances we, we convene to remember Dimitri as well. Um, but uh, finally, we're able to have you here for a conversation to talk about what's going on, and it couldn't come at a better time, because things have really changed since we first started talking. I mean, this is, on February 24th of this year, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, provoking not only a tragic war that has cost tens of thousands and, and perhaps more lives, but also generating one of the world's largest displacement crises in, in modern day, as millions of Ukrainians have sought refuge in Europe and in other parts of the world. Um, on March 3rd, and that is, I mean, less than two weeks later, the European Union invoked the Temporary Protection Directive, allowing one-year temporary protected status in all member states of, of the EU for Ukrainians, and then that was extended for another year on October 14th. And by the way, let me say again, February 24th was the invasion, March 3rd was the decision. That is record time in policy terms, right? I mean, that is like, you know, warp speed if you ever watch Star Trek. That is impressive, but it was also commensurate with the, the need at hand and, and the, the severity of what was going on and continues to go on. Um, although it's been on the books for almost two decades, the TPD, the Temporary Protective Protection Directive, was an instrument that had not been used before. Um, so far, almost 5 million, not quite, but almost 5 million Ukrainians have, have applied for TPD in different member states. Countries have a great deal of latitude about how they implement this. Um, but at the same time, there are some general guidelines that all agree to follow in this. Um, and Monique is, is at the helm of, of trying to make sure that this is, is implemented correctly and effectively and that there's some coordination among countries in the EU. Um, at MPI and MPI Europe, our sister organization in Brussels, headed by Hannah Behrens, we have a particular interest in the way that the global protection regime is evolving in creative ways, um, with countries often making pragmatic responses to displacement crises that provide immediate protection to those in need, even when the usual national response mechanisms can become overwhelmed. We have a longstanding partnership with the Robert Bosch Stiftung to look at some of these issues led by our colleague Susan Fratsky, as well as doing quite a bit of specific work in different areas of the world that look at very specific responses. And I j literally just finished this morning with, with Luciana Gandini, a paper looking at some of the responses in Latin America and the Caribbean to the Venezuelan crisis, which, which, bear, which are certainly different, but bear some similarities in some interesting ways to, to the EU response as well. Um, well, we're very fortunate to have Monique with us today to discuss the EU response at the nine month mark. How well is it working? What challenges are countries facing in implementing the TPD? What challenges are Ukrainians facing in Europe? And what does the future hold for all of this? Ms. Pariat has held a number of senior positions at the European Commission throughout her career, a very extensive career. I was actually looking at it this morning again and, and really quite impressive. Um, and so I'll only mention one, which was her last position of Director General of Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection at DG ECHO, also a very significant position. Um, she holds degrees from the College of Europe and the Institute of Political Studies of Strasbourg. And I'm very pleased to turn this over to Dr. Megan Benton, who's the Director of MPI's International Program and will lead today's discussion. Megan, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And if I could just uh, echo um, Andrew's words and say, we're just honored to have you here. And thank you so much for joining us. And thanks everyone in the room. You know, we're coming to the close of what's been just a really seismic year for immigration, for Europe. And I wanted to invite us to kind of get a bit, these chairs are not as comfy as they look. Sit back, get comfy, sit forward, get comfy. 
I, it is, it's a tall thing. The world is designed for tall men, yes. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, so, you know, Andrew mentioned just um, the speed and scale of this massive displacement crisis. You know, Europe's received large numbers of refugees and migrants before, but just how quickly this happened was just such a shock. So I wanted to ask, you know, what has this done to Europe? Um, what does it mean for policy responses to large-scale displacement going forward? Um, and what do the next years hold in terms of opportunities and challenges? So my, my first question um, is really about what happened with, with TPD. I think, you know, those of us on this side of the Atlantic really watched with bated breath um, as, that, as that was activated. And, and, you know, Andrew mentioned the warp speed. It's really been the signal achievement of this of this year, but I thought perhaps we could just ask you to reflect again on why it was so significant and for, for European countries, but also for Ukrainians, and what it meant in quite practical terms. Thank you, Meg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, finally, physically. <laughs> uh, if it come two years ago, we wouldn't have had the same conversation, but uh, but anyway, probably same issues uh, when it comes to migration. There are events in, you know, I'm old enough now to have witnessed a number of very important moments like the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the 9-11 attacks on the towers. Um, uh, the Brexit was also a big shock for us. And then 24th of February this year, we, where we also woke up with, uh, you know, in a shock state, uh, seeing a war on European soil, uh, not like we had the Yugoslavian war, but it was, let's say, the aftermath of the Berlin Wall, the more that kind of civil war, but this was an aggression, an, a war of aggression by the big, the big neighbor, Russia. On, on Ukraine. So it, it has been a, a real shock. And, uh, and I think that's also the strength of the European Union. Uh, we can be very slow, we can be very bureaucratic, but in difficult times, we are also able to respond quickly. And indeed, uh, four days after the, uh, the attacks, we had a special council of ministers where the decision to implement the temporary protection directive was taken uh, and, and then implemented just afterwards. So that was a uh, record time indeed, but shows when there is a political will, we can do it. Even with 27 member states, which is a complicated setup. The, the fact we had this temporary protection directive in our drawers for 20 years, which was actually resulting from the war in uh, Yugoslavia, where we had massive arrivals of people, but we were not really able to manage. So we had issued this, um, my predecessors, this, um, this directive that was addressing the situation of massive arrivals of refugees. And it had never been activated because we had never been really considered that this was, we were in such a situation. Uh, but this time, this was clearly a, a situation of people fleeing a conflict at the border of the European Union, because we have uh, borders with, with Russia all along uh, and, um, and with Ukraine. So that was not with Russia, yes, but also with, with Ukraine in this particular case, that people had to leave and the only place they could leave couldn't go to Russia for obvious reasons, they had to come to the EU. So that's, that's why we had this, uh, we could, there was no discussion to apply this temporary protection directive. So this is a directive that is implementing for one year and that can be renewed. As you said, we have renewed it for another year, can be renewed for a third year and then we will see. Um, so what the beauty of it is that it provides uh, uh, people that flee, uh, like the refugees uh, from Ukraine, with immediate rights, which are very similar to rights for, uh, for to the, the, the rights you get when you get asylum, without having to go through the asylum procedures. So this is... Um, a, a fast way to receive people. We had 
massive arrivals uh, at the at the Polish border, at the Romanian border, at uh, all the borders that that are that we have with, with Ukraine. So we had to deal with that very fast. People were, and we didn't know what would happen huh? because this was we didn't know how massive the uh, the attacks would be, so we had to get people out of Ukraine. So that was the, the way to process people fast and uh, and being able to provide them with the benefits that are attached to asylum without, uh, without major procedures. So they can access the labor market, they can access education, so children can go to school, they have access to uh, social benefits, and uh, uh, they can uh, they have access to medical care. So this is more or less the full fledged uh, system of protection. And they were really crucial measures to help people that were completely also shell shocked huh, about the situation. Don't forget, most of the people were, 80% of the refugees were uh, women with children because men couldn't leave the country, they had to fight. So they were leaving behind their husband, their brother, their father, uh, and uh, and elderly people also, not, not all of them could travel. So it was really, really a disaster. So I think with that, we have been able to... Um, to help to provide immediate relief to people that were fleeing this conflict. And uh, we, we also, you know, along the days, we found out a lot of problems. Uh, people that were arriving, we had a very trivial issue, pets, for instance. Mm -hmm. Many people arrive with their pets, so we had not foreseen that. What do we do with pets? Mm -hmm. So we had to, just to, this is an anecdote, huh? but uh, among the many <laughs> issues we had also to deal with, what do we do with pets? And, uh, and to find housing to people, to find uh, the first medical aid. Many people were also mentally shocked. So we had to address that. We had a number of unaccompanied children, actually not that many, but still. We were also very rapidly, uh, aware of uh, possible security concerns, we would have also security issues. So we tried also to, you know, find the square, the circle between processing people fast, but also having a minimum of checks on, on security. So what, what was done, and particularly in Poland, is that people were just let, you know, checked at the border very quickly, then brought to reception centers where they could be, uh, could undergo a more, a more thorough security checks, so to say, without being too, too cumbersome. Um, we had the issue of uh, where these people could, could go. Uh, actually, we had no compulsory uh, reallocation of people. They moved pretty much along the diaspora because many of them had uh, relatives, families, uh, friends in different EU member states. There is, there was a very, there is a very big diaspora of Ukrainian people in Poland, uh, but also in Italy or in Spain or in Portugal, strangely. Uh, so that has guided, let's say, the, the travel of people and uh, avoided a too massive concentration. But obviously the countries at the border are the ones that have the, the most uh, important population of refugees, Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Romania had a lot of them, but they, they went through many of them um, and, uh, and a few Baltic states also. Uh, Germany, one million in Germany, uh, but countries like my own country, France, for instance, have not less than maybe 80,000, less than 100,000. So this has functioned pretty well, I have to say. Uh, we have also rapidly published uh, information, so frequently asked questions also, because they were huge question, where to go? Where do I get a train to go there? How can I uh, 
do we have the issue to of money? How do I withdraw cash from a bank, uh, a bank, uh, an ATM? So all these issues we had to address and to try to find response. So we we have tried to put that into a frequently asked question document that was published on on our websites in uh, in different languages, including in Russian and Ukrainian, so that uh, people could know more about where they could be uh, received, uh, what kind of supports they could get. Some, many of them were afraid to move, to move further also. They wanted to stay in Poland, for instance. And we, with that, we tried to explain to them they could move, they would get the same benefit everywhere. So, so that was um, quite a, a huge exercise. We spent quite a, quite a time Mm -hmm. I suppose there's a little bit of a shift happening right now. I mean, the measures that you've been describing were very much in the realm of emergency response. Yes. And one challenge, of course, is, is now that the uh, conflict has become quite protracted, there's you know, concerns about another um, surge of refugees, mm -hmm. perhaps fleeing a very cold winter. What's, what's the shift happening now for sort of more longer term planning? And I, I was interested in, you said, um, We've renewed TPD for another year, we can do another year, and then we'll see. It's very hard to think about people's long-term integration when you don't know how yeah. long they'll stay. But you know, how how are Ukrainians doing right now in labor yeah. markets and housing yeah. and education? You pointed to access to all of these things, but what happens on paper is not, you know, yes. always the same in practice. So what I described were the first emergency yeah. measures. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, so we have now much more structured <laughs> system. So we have this uh, temporary protection in place. We have also set up a temporary protection register at EU level so that we have a better idea of how many people are in the system, are registered, which was also quite a challenge to set that uh, within a couple of weeks. We need also, because you know, you need also to avoid abuse of the system. This is a bit sad to, to have to say that, but uh, we have also to uh, pay attention to the support of the European population is, is also fragile. Uh, they have been extremely welcoming, but they would not want any abuse of the system. So, and we, we need to keep that uh, also under control so that um, we know that also the number of people we have in Europe, but also we can allow also people to go back and come back. So we have this temporary protection registration system, and we have so far about 4.5 million people registered that are in the EU. So it means the EU has been able to welcome 4.5 million people, is for the moment hosting 4.5 million people. And we had uh, the, the number of people that have transited were 8 million. I think we are around 8 million that people that entered the EU after the 24th of February. Some of them returned. Uh, you have a number of movements also of people that work and go back and so on. But so that just to say, I think that is something I want to underline because I don't think anybody in Europe would have thought this would be possible. We have uh, about uh, uh, 700 children uh, in schools. We have some 300 um, to 400 people that are in the labor market now. So I think that's also quite, quite uh, impressive. We have put in place a, a pilot, which we call the talent pool, which is a system to match labor uh, shortages with the skills of the Ukrainian people so that there is a, a way to better integrate refugees uh, into the labor market of the EU. Uh, so I think uh, we have obviously, this represents a massive cost also, you can easily imagine for all the countries. So we have also helped uh, a lot the countries, receiving countries. Uh, we have provided in, in my director general 400 million uh, to additional support for, uh, for in particular the countries at the border. Uh, and we have also facilitated the disbursement of all our um, cohesion funds uh, 
so that uh, there is uh, more access to uh, cash flow uh, so that the countries can use this money to address the needs of the refugees. So that was also a massive operation. Um, and, and maybe to come back to your question, uh, the situation is fragile. Well, I mean, on, for those who are there, I think, again, I have to praise the, the welcoming spirit of all member states because there has been no major issues in UK makeups uh, the first days and weeks, but uh, people are accepted, integrated, uh, it functions. The problem is what will happen now because we see uh, the, uh, the massive uh, bombing on uh, critical infrastructure, on energy power, uh, that, you know, make for people that went back, uh, it very difficult, who hadn't left, uh, it make it very difficult to stay. So we are working on a, we have worked on a contingency planning where we have different scenarios, up to four, another four million wave of people coming. But I have to say with that, um, I, I would think we could manage, but uh, we would probably need to have a more forceful redirection of people to those countries that have less uh, refugees than, uh, than the one that are now pretty stretched like Poland and for the Czech Republic, where they would not be able to face another massive arrivals of people. So we would need to have um, a more uh, organized systems of, of, of distributing people. But I think we are better equipped also. We, we have the experience of, uh, okay. of the first wave. So we are better equipped in terms of information, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of also identifying what needs to be done. And I think member states are also prepared to have uh, reception facilities like sports halls or, uh, you know, you know, in Berlin, you have an airport that hosted refugees, uh, former airport. So member states are looking at possible reception facilities mm -hmm. in case we would have it. it. It's always hard in the absence of a counterfactual to really kind of evaluate progress and success. But I wonder if there's part of you that has this kind of alternate reality in your head of what might have happened if TPD hadn't been activated. I mean, what how, what, what different challenges might have arisen if that had been the case? Well, I think as yes, it was, you know, in um, when I said at the beginning, a TPD allowed to people uh, to process people uh, rapidly. I think we, if we hadn't had TPD, we would have had to use the normal asylum uh, uh, legislation, <clears throat> which would have meant massive. Uh, overload on asylum systems. So it would have been very chaotic. So I think uh, we were extremely happy to have that. Um, and just to say, we wanted to repeal TPD in our proposal on the migration pact. So now we are thinking that maybe we should not repeal it. <laughs> but, uh, so that sometimes you have a legislation that you have, you know, sleeping somewhere and uh, you're very happy to find them, to have them back. I mean, so I, I understand <laughs> the concerns there, but I, I mean, is there also some perhaps optimism that this could provide the blueprint for responses to future crises? Um, you know, the, and the amount of coordination that happened, could that be repeated again? Is there any optimism you feel going forward? Well, I think on the positive side is that, uh, you know, now we know we can do it. Mm. And I think this is, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, I, even me, I wouldn't have been so optimistic we would be able to, to manage, but we did. So it means we can do it and we've done it and we are, may have to do it again. So it means also, and this is also very, reassuring in those times where there is a very anti-migration uh, spirit everywhere that, uh, let's say, there is still this sense of uh, 
providing solidarity, being having solidarity, compassion for people who are in need. And this was very much felt. You should have seen the the uh, the arrival of people at the Polish border. That was so uh, heartbreaking, but also everybody was helping. Everybody was there to support. All families everywhere, even in the most remote place, uh, you know, we were all asking, how, how can we help them? What can we do? You know, at a very small level sometimes, but everybody was, you know, happy to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it shows that we are, we still have a heart for people that suffer uh, and that we can make it, as I said, huh? 27 member states being able, not being able to agree on the migration policy for years, but being able to agree on applying this uh, temporary protection directive and on hosting so many millions of people in a, in a, in a very short time. This is, if this is the, the miracle solution for every migration situation, uh, no, because uh, this is clearly a situation of massive arrivals of refugees. Uh, this, um, I'm not sure this is a pattern for more, um, you know, economic migrations, arrivals, uh, irregular arrivals. One thing I didn't mention was also that we had, uh, we had uh, also a, um, a visa. Um, it was a, a visa exemption policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, so people can could come to the EU without uh, without any visa. So if they had an electronic passport, they could come. So it facilitated so also. So they were allowed to enter. Even if we hadn't had the temporary protection directive, they could have come to the EU, but only for three months. And then we would have had a problem. But uh, so that was also a different situation than when you have massive arrivals of people that arrive completely irregularly at the border with no papers and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mentioned solidarity, and indeed it's been really impressive. Do you worry at all about hospitality fatigue, about this kind of dwindling support? I mean, I'm going to I'm going to Prague this afternoon, um, and I was looking at the weather, and it is snowing a lot. Um, and you know, there's already a lot of concerns about cost of living and yeah. inflation. And I mean, I think Czech Republic had inflation of 16% yeah. last month, yeah. and I've also been among you know the, the highest recipients. Is this support going to maintain and how long will it and where are the sort of pockets of dissent going to come from? Uh, look, I think again, uh, this uh, massive solidarity, this was, you know, let's say that the heart uh, <laughs> response, uh, you are, everybody is ready to host people for a couple of days, maybe weeks, but after that, yes, you have to find other solutions. So we we have housing issues and we would have very big massive well important housing issues in particular in some member states if this situation would increase if we would have massive arrivals so we yes there is a i it's difficult to predict how long this support could uh, could stay but as long as we see the situation evolving uh, as it is in Ukraine, uh, I think this sense of solidarity still exists, but there is indeed um, the, the cost of living that has increased. So there is also, uh, you know, uh, we, we would need to avoid that people feel they, the refugees are better treated than uh, the poorer people. So that's where we have to be very attentive. And that's why we have this registration platform that helps also, because we have to be sure that people that receive the benefit of the temporary protection are really staying in the EU and not back to Ukraine. So that's uh, where we have um, elaborated a system so that we have better control on that in the sense that people can go back because we didn't want to discourage them to go back, but uh, many were scared to go back and not being able to come back to mm -hmm. the evil situation worsens. So we have now in place a system where they have to declare if they go back. So we freeze the benefit of the protection, but they still keep it. 
So it's it's there. So if they have to come back, we reactivate mm -hmm. the benefits of it. And I think it's also a good way to show uh, the our own uh, citizens that we provide support for those who do need support, but not without any control. And um, so, that's mm, I mean, it's an interesting model of protection to have it intersect with what was already historical circular labor mobility between mm. Ukraine and Europe and could in the future be more circular movements. I mean, mm. do you see, especially given the labor shortages you pointed to, um, potentially more kind of circular mobility that could also have economic benefits in yeah. the future once, yeah. you know, the crisis is over? Absolutely. And uh, as I said, there is a shortage we've seen after the pandemic or during and after the pandemic, we've seen quite a substantial shortage in many uh, sectors and in, in Europe where we have an aging population on the first hand. And secondly, there are a number of, of jobs people have less interest in doing. So we have ma massive shortage in the uh, food and beverage sector, restaurants, um, hotels, in the healthcare sector, in the computer sector, we need more and more people that code, for instance. Uh, uh, so we have a shortage in, let's say, a bit lower skills. Uh, and uh, that's where uh, there is uh, certainly a good match. And people are welcomed. And if they are welcome, they are better integrated also. Mm. And, uh, and we provide also language trainings, uh, integration, uh, we finance integration uh, programs. So I think we've put an, an incredible system of support uh, through the municipalities, through uh, NGOs. Uh, we are also, we have a program called Safe House uh, Program, where we work with the Federation of the Red Cross to help those who are hosting refugees, to help on the housing side. So, I think we, we we try to consolidate all that in a, in a kind of structured way so that we have a better control of it and are also better able to balance this need to help people, but also the concern of the population that could maybe feel at some stage that we, you know, we treat refugees better than we treat uh, we treat them. My, my phone is literally lighting up with questions that are coming in, which is very exciting and also slightly stressful. And it means that I'm concerned about monopolizing any more of your time. So I'm going to open this up and, um, and invite you to uh, say who you are and pose a question. It'd be lovely to bring things back to this hemisphere too and, you know, draw out some of the parallels and challenges and perhaps ask Monique for some advice. I know. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, I will um, look at some of these questions I'm getting from online. There's a roving mic, which will come to you. Yes, gentlemen at the back. And meanwhile, I will just be checking my questions. Hello, Alex Cool, instructor and PhD candidate at American University. So of course, it's not just Ukrainian nationals directly impacted by Russia's war. Asylum seekers and refugees already within Ukraine prior to the invasion are now experiencing a type of dual displacement, dual crisis, if you will. And there are news reports that these individuals going to the EU are not experiencing the same welcoming posture uh, socially and also in terms of the temporary uh, protective directive uh, as, as Ukrainians. So I'm hoping you could, you could speak to that a little bit more and what's being done by the EU to fairly uh, treat all individuals displaced from Ukraine, not just Ukrainian nationals. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, so the temporary protection directive applies to Everybody that were was in Ukraine uh, before, well, on the 24th of February, uh, including third country nationals that were in Ukraine on a permanent basis or under international protection. So it does not apply to, uh, for instance, students uh, or people that were on a short term basis and that could return to their home countries. So, and we organize quite uh, important uh, air bridges with India, for instance, where we had a lot of Indian students. Uh, they, they could come to, to the EU, but then we organize uh, together with the country of origins, 
uh, flights to take them back to their country. So uh, when we say re Ukrainian refugees, it includes also people that were in Ukraine, uh, either on a permanent basis because they were married to Ukrainians or because they were living in Ukraine for a long time, and people under uh, international protection in Ukraine. And the others, as said, uh, most of them, uh, we had big support for their countries of origin to, to take them back uh, and make sure that they could come go back to the countries uh, pretty safely. Thank you. I will take two more from the audience, Frank. Um, and then if anyone else wants to jump in, yes, this gentleman halfway up as well on the left. Do you have two roving mics or just one? Okay, one just go to Frank. <laughs> Hi, I'm Frank Sherry. I work on immigration and refugee issues here in America. Um, I'm just interested in public opinion and political will in Europe. We, like in our own country here in America, we read about the rise of right-wing parties and an anti-immigrant populism that is uh, infecting and in some places dominating politics. I'm just, uh, what factors do you site to say, wow, the response of solidarity and welcome has been so generous. I never, I mean, just to be blunt, I never thought Poland would be so welcoming. I just, you know, with a right-wing party and the populism that the governing party has, has, has used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just, is it that it was fellow Europeans? Is it that there was, you know, sort of bottom-up public support? Was there a shaping of political will by leaders? All of it. I'm just interested in your take on that. That's a big question. So let's not do two at once. And then Frank can... Yes. Um, look, I think uh, people realized, uh, I think the, the solidarity with you to Ukrainian people, to, to people fleeing the conflict in Ukraine to better respond to the previous question, uh, was a bottom-up thing. So that was not driven by governments. People felt, you know, this this is our neighbor. And I think the, the fact that the aggression was also coming from a big country without, honestly, other justification than the, the will to destroy Ukraine. So that was very much heartfelt. Clearly, Ukrainians are neighbors. Uh, uh, as I said, we have a big diaspora of Ukrainian people in the EU, so that, that contributed to the solidarity, but also the aggression uh, contributed to that. Uh, and uh, yes, it was maybe surprising to see countries like Poland uh, being so welcoming, but at the same time, it shows that, you know, we should go beyond stereotypes. And... Uh, I think the, the big issue people have uh, in Europe, but probably here too, is the feeling that migration is uncontrolled. That, uh, you know, you, are, you will be overwhelmed by waves of migrants, which is also totally exaggerated because if we look at figures, it's not that, uh, that the case. But there is this narrative of being you know, of having uncontrolled arrivals. So, and that's what we need to address. People accept that if you're faced with a situation like uh, uh, Ukrainian people were faced with, uh, clearly you have to help. So that's clearly a situation of refugee where you have to help people. Like it is, you know, that according to the obligation we have under the Geneva Convention, where people, I think where there is a bit less understanding is, arrivals, irregular arrivals uh, for other purposes, and which is maybe for, for economic migration purposes, even if there is a lot of understanding that people cannot make a living in their countries and they want to look for a better future. But this has to be organized orderly. And this is what our migration pact is about, how to organize that uh, in a way that people are accepted. And that's why we want to develop legal pathways for people to come, but also work together with countries of origin and transit to help them to reduce the irregular arrival of people, better protect the border. But we have to address the problem before people are at the border. We have to take it much further upstream 
so that we work on the root causes of migration, on uh, helping uh, people to return also if they come to the EU and are not eligible for asylum, and that they re people can be returned. We support with integration programs, but this is the sense of uncontrolled migration that creates, in my view, uh, this feeling. Thank you. Um, gentleman halfway up, and then Andrew. Uh, je vous remercie, madame. I'm Gary Kleiman. I'm uh, affiliated with Georgetown's uh, International Migration Institute, among other capacities. Um, we are always citing Poland's welcome, uh, and you mentioned some numbers, but Poland is also facing hard budget realities. Uh, Poland itself has spent, you mentioned 400 million euro for the region as a whole. Poland has spent 10 times that amount on its own, uh, close to 4 billion or 2% of GDP just this year. And now as of March, it's shifting uh, half the cost burden of shelter, as well as ending a lot of other support programs as of March, expecting that uh, refugees will cover half their costs. Is this um, a policy that the EU is okay with? Is there another package uh, in the offing? Is there some sort of standardization of the cost sharing um, you know, that Brussels has in mind for the regional response? Yeah. People online and just add in a couple of questions here. One is about whether the commission is going to give guidance to member states about um, allowing um, a change of status, in-country change of status, so from TPD to traditional economic migration routes. Um, and then another one is about the, the large implementation challenges of, of the TPD, so that some rights that are outlined by the TPD are not guaranteed in practice and the... Um, the, the questioner um, gives the example of um, Ukrainian children in the Romanian public education system. Many questions. <laughs> so on the, financial, many on the financial side, uh, what we have tried, uh, we, we are fully aware of the big burden it, it poses on uh, countries. So what we have uh, immediately done as EU support to that is to uh, modify our programs. We have different programs called cohesion funds. Uh, one to, which is a regional uh, fund, one is the social fund, other one cohesion funds. Basically, they are funds to help countries to develop uh, the infrastructure, to help uh, businesses, uh, to, uh, to work on the social side, provide social benefits and so on. So these programs, we have taken a number of measures. I don't want to go into the details of them, but basically to extend the possibility to use unused funds that were under the current period uh, so that uh, these funds could be released for them to support uh, refugees. And then uh, for the new programs that start from this year, uh, we have also allowed for increased pre-financing possibilities, increased uh, more rapid disbursement of, of some. So we have stretched and eased the system of financing as much as possible so that these, and we're talking about billion of, of euros, huh? so that this could be available to the countries that were under pressure uh, with, with the... Um, uh, the situation of Ukraine. In itself, it's not additional money to what was planned to help them, but this was a way for them to retarget it and to use it much more rapidly to address the situation of refugees. We are encouraging also uh, the integration into the labor sector because the more people get into the labor sector, the less they will, uh, they will uh, be um, on uh, on the social security schemes. Uh, so that's also a way to alleviate uh, the sector. And we know that in Poland, for instance, Poland had already 1.5 million uh, Ukrainian people working um, as uh, in the labor market. So, and they have possibilities, uh, further possibilities for that. So I think that was a way uh, to help. As I mentioned at the beginning, we also provided uh, as additional money, 400 million euros for the countries on the, the most affected. And obviously the last share of that went to Poland. 
So that's how, uh, and I'm not talking about all the supports that we, the other kind of support that we have provided uh, also in terms of support for the energy uh, sector, for the economic uh, recovery of these countries. We have the recovery plan that is also now agreed for all countries, including Hungary <laughs> since yesterday. Uh, so I think they, they are a lot of instruments that are available for member states that they can use to help uh, to address the situation. This, and then also the question of um, lane changes, status changes. Uh, look, TPD is, a, as I said, it's not a long-term solution, but it's a solution that provides, you know, what is necessary for the people to. Uh, I, I, we have to see how the situation evolves. Uh, I have to say that most of the people that arrive, they don't want to stay. They want to go back to Ukraine. So let's see. Let's see how things evolve. As I said, children are in school. Uh, we try to integrate as many as possible into the labor sector. So uh, I think so far we are coping. Uh, they can, uh, after that, there's also the possibility to ask for asylum that remains, obviously. Uh, but there is no specific need to do that for the moment until they are under TPD, but they can they still have the possibility. It doesn't exclude the possibility to, uh, to ask for asylum. But uh, I see more prospects in the sense of integration uh, for those who want to stay into the labor market. And, uh, and then to see, we are also uh, obviously... Uh, there is today a conference in Paris on the reconstruction of Ukraine. So we have pledged uh, 18 billion euros to help uh, Ukraine. Uh, we are giving massive humanitarian support for winterization for uh, people that are displaced. I think we have now about 1 billion euro that have, we have dispersed in, in terms of humanitarian assistance or civil protection uh, so in kind support. Uh, we have also disbursed 1 billion euro for economic support to Ukraine. We have, um, uh, you know, abolished trade uh, trade um, taxes also for products coming from Ukraine. We've worked in all sectors uh, to help Ukraine to keep floating and and then to see how to, to be able to come back to... Uh, to um, the situation as before, we are helping also the railway, uh, the sustainability of the railway system, including in Moldova. I didn't mention Moldova, but we are also massively supporting Moldova, which is the weak link in, in the region, uh, also for criminality. So we have set up a um, security hub where we support the Moldovan government to address security issues related to the conflict. So this is a massive investment uh, of the EU. We have, I was reading yesterday, we have produced a 44 pages document of all the support the European Commission has been giving together with the member state in all sectors. And even I was, because I work in fishery department, <laughs> I was also reading how we support, you know, the fishery sector that cannot, you know, fish anymore in the Black Sea. Uh, you know, this, you know, you have not one single department in the European Commission that does not support Ukraine in one way or the other. And then um, we'll go to Andrew. By the way, I noticed the fishery part of your of your career along the way. You've worked on a number of things, but that, that actually didn't catch my attention, um, uh, which are all great preparation for your current role. Um, let me, I want to emphasize something you said, and then there's a question with this, which is, you know, People, Europe has been able to withstand the arrival of, of a large number of Ukrainians, millions of Ukrainians. The U.S. is withstanding the arrival of large numbers of people, mostly from the Western Hemisphere. People are moving into the labor market. There are certainly strains in schools and healthcare systems, but they've been managed. You know, the numbers are not the issue. It's the control. It's the perception that there's an order and a control. And when there's an order and control, people are much more comfortable with this. So it's less about the number, and this is something I think we could learn in the United States as well. It's less about the numbers than it is the perception that there's an order and a system 
with how people are coming in. It's the credibility question there. So my question to you is this, and, and this may be an unfair question at this point, you know, the, the Ukrainian displacement crisis is unique, right? I mean, it, it's hard to imagine another crisis that would generate such rapid consensus among all the members to produce a TPD. But is there anything we learn from the response to the Ukrainian crisis that could be applied to other migration flows or displacement crises? Not with a TPD necessarily, but in terms of how do you make something the challenge is always sort of this perception that the system is being overrun, that there, there isn't a way of change. Is there anything we learn about creating order out of chaos that creates credibility that we learn from this crisis and the response? Yes, it's a bit early to draw lessons, but um, but still, yes, I, I, I come back to the point I made before. I think we need to have an orderly system of managing migration. Well, in the Ukrainian situation, there was a big solidarity wave for people. I think even with the Syria crisis uh, some years ago, I think it's it's also wrong to say that people were not feeling compassion for Syrian people. But again, this was this impression that it was totally in control, that we would be, you know, we were not able to address massive arrivals of people. There is a strong support of people I can give you a few figures. We have, for the moment, I think around 600,000 asylum requests in the EU this year. It's massive. We have people, so we don't talk about that. We have, I think, about 5 million people uh, in the, under legal migration schemes. So there is all this part of which nobody talks about, which functions, but it functions because it is orderly regulated and orderly managed. And we talk about, uh, okay, this year we have more, we will, we will be probably to around 300,000 irregular arrivals. Huh? But still, it's a lot, but it's still much less than the numbers of people that, that work regularly, stay regularly, uh, that are accepted. We have very important resettlement programs we have resettled uh, 40,000 people from Afghanistan. We, don't, we didn't talk about Afghanistan, but a year before we had Afghanistan. No? We have resettled a massive amount of people uh, from Afghanistan, from Syria, uh, and it's not over. We have just had a resettlement pledge uh, of, um, I think, 130,000 uh, uh, pledges for next year. Uh, in that you have humanitarian admissions also, a large part for Afghan, Afghan people. So I think, again, when there are situations where it's clear you see the need for Afghan people, for Afghan women, we don't return Afghan people. Uh, we still see the situation is serious, not solved. We have a big issue with Lebanon because uh, Lebanon is, is on the brink of uh, failure. And we have, uh, uh, you know, and remember at the time I was working in ECO, 25% of the population were Syrian refugees. Can you imagine 25% of the population? If you had that here in the state, millions of people, we would, in Europe, it's totally inconceivable. So that's, we see that people are aware of that. But again, there is also, we have to have a more regulated system of, integrated people that want to come to the EU to work, to have a better future. This has to be done in an orderly way with the countries of origin. And this talent pool initiative we have now as a pilot with Ukrainian people, we want to develop that with third countries so that we have comprehensive partnership with countries like Morocco, Tunisia, or Egypt, where we have, on the one hand, legal pathways for work, for humanitarian admission, and uh, on the other side, support to their border management, support to their uh, own asylum policy, but also a better commitment from them to return, to take back people that we arrived irregularly. I don't know if I replied to your question. But... 
Thank you. Um, so we only have five minutes left. So I'm going to take um, two from the audience if there are two people ready. And then I'm just going to read um, a couple from online um, as Lawrence allocates the mic. One is about housing. I know we touched on this, but this is just a huge pressure point already and could become a much more long term challenge. You know, what are you doing to address that? Yes, oh, we sorry, have. I'm going <laughs> yeah, yeah, to return to you. And then actually, I had promised to take another one. Lawrence, have you already? Yes. Great. I can't see that far, but there we go. Much. Um, actually, two questions. Uh, I was recently in Turkey and was struck with the large number of single Russian men that ev everywhere I turned. So you were talking about Ukrainian women as being the, the, the predominant part of the Ukrainian population in the EU. Are you thinking about or preparing for Russian asylum seekers, Russian men in particular, who are evading conscription, dissidents and whatever coming from Russia? That's question one. Question two is really a reaction to what you were saying about relocation if there's a second wave. And it's a perhaps a contingency or, or a, a hypothetical. But I, I, I was listening to, you were saying that you know in the first wave, people were spontaneously going to Portugal, Spain, places where they had families um, in Poland. But we saw from 2015 that when you attempted to have an equitable relocation sharing agreement among the European Union, it, it fell apart completely, largely ironically because Poland uh, and Czech Republic were refused to, uh, to participate in that. Um, so if there is a second wave, how are you planning to manage an equitable relocation scheme of the kind that you mentioned? And, and how does this square with um, you know, free movement of people so in terms of secondary migration, how would you sort of keep them in place if you were able to do that in the first place? Yeah, uh, on that question quickly, uh, we have, <clears throat> uh, uh, we well, anyway, there is no possibility of having mandatory relocation. Uh, if it's the question, this is no. We see that in the negotiations of the Pact on Migration, mandatory relocation is a no-go. So there will not be such things. So we will call on, you know, voluntary, uh, commitment. So try also to advise people to go to countries where there are maybe more reception capacities uh, than others. Uh, I think it's also in the interest of people to have, you know, if they have a roof in France, why should they go to Germany if there is none? So I think that that we would have to see how we will manage that. But uh, this is more in terms of, you know, ad advising and calling on having you know, better repartition along the line of the possibilities of the different reception capacities in the different member states. On the uh, Russian um, uh, young men, so we had the issue when uh, Putin called for a conscription of uh, 300 people. Uh, then uh, we had just issued, because we have a visa facilitation scheme with Russia, which we have suspended in the meantime, and we have also produced, uh, also in a speedy way, <laughs> guidelines on uh, advising our member states, because they are responsible for the production, for the issuing of uh, issuance of visas, on how to address uh, a request for visa from Russia. And uh, we have produced quite re relatively strict guidelines uh, um, uh, where you know we visas to Russian people are still possible, but uh, which would be for family reasons, compelling reasons, uh, of course for dissidents, for humanitarian purposes, and so on. But it were avoiding uh, conscription was clearly not uh, considered as being a um, let's say a humanitarian <laughs> condition to grant a visa. So, and this has been pretty well implemented. Uh, we are not really faced with a lot of arrivals of, uh, of uh, Russian people. We have more or less, well, discouraged to issue visa for tourism. I think it's a bit difficult to see a Russian tourist in Europe where they are, you know, bombing um, Ukraine. So uh, the borders with Finland is also the Finland has a very restrictive policy to um, to apply that uh, while but respecting the conditions for people that either for working or family reasons or humanitarian reason may may have to come. And the consulates are following these guidelines pretty much uh, thoroughly. 
Oh, housing, housing, yeah, housing is a big issue. No, housing is a big issue. It's already an issue for uh, for our own population. So this is an issue, and this is probably one of the major issue we would be faced with if we have another massive influx of people. So we have these safe house programs I mentioned to support uh, people that are ready to host uh, uh, refugees, uh, also to to provide um, um, you know some accommodations. Uh, some people have uh, given, you know, the second house uh, for refugees. And I had a friend of mine who just did talking about that recently. So, but the housing problem is an issue. Absolutely an issue, yes. Thank you so much. I feel like we've worked you incredibly hard. Thank you for your mastery of the brief, your panda, Monique Carrier from 